follow your heart and do your thing. Because I think ultimately that really resonates with people if it's this genuine piece of expression. Welcome to the Gig Boss Podcast, where musicians go to learn how to navigate the new music economy. I'm Adam Eckler, and it's my mission to get you the tools to have a thriving career in music and learn some stuff along the way. Today, my guest is Grace Kelly. Grace was performing with the Boston Pops when she was 14 years old, and she was widely considered a young prodigy on her instrument. Young prodigies are often in the spotlight. Their skill at such a young age is nearly unbelievable to our ears, and so we put them on pedestals and we put them in magazines and we throw them as headliners on festivals. But in those situations, I often find myself wondering what they're going to do in five years, what they're going to do in 10 years, what they're going to do in 15 years. I want to see this person become an artist. And with my guest today, recently winning the John Lennon songwriting contest for her song, Feels Like Home, and performing with Stephen Colbert's band and John Baptiste and her new band, We Are Too Sexy with Leo P., I think that's exactly where Grace Kelly is at in her career. Bridging the gap between virtuosic musician and cultural phenomena. I read that sentence on your uh, on your bio on your website, and I, I thought it was a really interesting way of describing your career, especially considering sort of what you've been up to lately. And I want to spend a little time unpacking that, um, but let's do that by going back in time a little bit. We tend to idolize child prodigies we we like especially in jazz land which is where i've kind of come up in my career um and you were performing with like the boston pops when you were 14 a, co- a composition that you wrote uh which is prodigious by all measures uh what was your experience like getting that much attention as an artist that young and do you feel that that was a net positive experience or i imagine that could have had some of its uh, own challenges yeah no that's a great question um i think at the time being so young I wasn't really thinking about anything except the music and being like, this is so cool. This opportunity is so cool. And I was so nervous Hmm. for it. And there's a lot of things that happened through my, you know, I've been doing this since I was 12 years old, this, you know, as a recording artist, performing artist, I have never had any other job. Yeah. I feel feel really fortunate that my whole life I've gotten to do something that I feel so passionate about. Um, but it's, it's really interesting because when I reflect about my early days, um, and hearing that term like prodigy, like I never titled myself as anything. And I was just going with the wave of like, wow, I've got another cool gig and I'm meeting this person doing that and this, and that, um, and just growing, you know, every step of the way. And so it's, um, it's interesting now to kind of reflect back to what was happening then, because it was certainly happening very fast. And, um, you know, early on, even at, even when I began as like a professional musician at 12 years old, I still didn't know if that was what I was going to be like doing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And where, so was it your parents that kind of were, were guiding you in that, uh, in some way, kind of pushing you? My parents and I are very close and they are the most supportive, amazing parents. And I could not do what I've do and what I've done without their support. And, um, it was always my choice to, to want to play music and do it. Cause my parents aren't musicians. And my mom was actually in the beginning against the idea of me becoming a musician. Um, mm. there's other, yeah, there's other people in her family, like my aunt and grandma who were, uh, were classical musicians, um, and kind of lived that life. And my mom is like, the artist life is just so hard. I don't want to mm-hmm. see me do that. But then when it was so apparent to them that this was my joy and passion and my teachers were saying to them, she's really good at this. And my teachers were inviting me to their jam sessions. And then, you know, my mom was turned the corner and said, okay, well, if you do want to do this, I'm going to we're going to fully support you. Um, and you know, be there every step of the way. And my dad was always just hugely from the very beginning, you know, all in. So actually early on in my career, um, my dad was my manager and he was traveling everywhere with me. So we literally traveled the world together, you know, from when I was 12 years old through my, um, teenage years, 
Wow. Yeah, because he was like, I'm not going to let my little girl just go to Norway for the first time or with strangers Sure. You know, in eighth grade. And at the time, he had reached out to other you know, managers and, and in the jazz world. And they had said, like, your daughter's really talented, but we can't afford to take on like a new artist. Like new artists don't make money. That takes a lot of work to develop them. And then yep. there was a pretty well-known jazz manager who said to him, but you know, if you do this for a couple of years, you'll learn, you'll learn the ropes. And my dad had gone to business school too. So that's mm. what, that's what he did. And, and we had, we both have had amazing mentors along the way. Of course, I've had amazing musical mentors and we were meeting people in the business who were helping on that side of things too. So we really were having this amazing adventure together. That's awesome. Right. So that must have been, a, I mean, that must be now looking back, must be a time that you cherished being with your dad. I mean, my, my dad passed when I was 21 or something and I'm, you know, it's like the time that I had with him in high school, I worked at his company. He had a cell phone company and I like helped selling cell phones when I was in high school. And it's just like, I, I look back at that time and I really cherish it, even though it was like, it was, you know, it was work. It was like, it wasn't fun. Um, right. the same way that music and touring is fun, but I really cherish that time with my dad. That's so cool that you got to spend that time with him. Really special. Yeah. I think that, you know, working with your family comes with its own challenges as yeah. I'm I'm sure you experience too, um, but we have been very blessed to have a great relationship over the years and um, have a very, yeah, I think that's such a special, those are very special experiences that I've had, you know, with my dad and um, I'm, yeah, I'm really grateful. For that's them. awesome. Yeah. Music's really taken us both. I mean, when I was in high school, it was like, I think his first time that he got to go to Europe or something, or maybe mm -hmm. second time, it might've been his first time. So yeah. Yeah. A lot of new experiences together. That's cool. Uh, so, you know, b you know, being a probable prodigy, we use quotes, you don't, don't necessarily call yourself a prodigy, but um, that doesn't automatically mean that you found yourself as an artist either. And, and anytime I see, young, young prodigies players like Joey Alexander, people like that, that come up and that are just like mind boggling. And there's something about jazz maybe that attracts uh, like a, a kind of mind that can pick that apart and really begin to understand the language early. Um, yeah. I always, I always sit back and go, okay, now I'm going to wait and see what happens with this person. Like when will they really become an artist, come into themselves and, you know, listening to your work, your more recent work, I just, I just, for the first time, I hadn't heard Feels Like Home yet. And we watched it the other night, my wife and I, and I was just like goosebumps. It was like, it was such a beautiful piece. Um, and I, I love the, this, like when you picked up your saxophone that you didn't shred, you just played this real simple thing and then went back into this because it really fit the, the mood of the tune. And I think all of those things are signs of, of maturity and an artist kind of coming into their own. And obviously this song won the John Lennon songwriting contest. Um, so to me, you know, from an outside looking in, it, it feels to me like you're sort of finding yourself as an artist in a, in a really big way, especially in the last handful of years. Um, and maybe that's a weird thing to say because uh, because you've been so successful throughout your career. But is, is that how it feels to you right now in, in your in your it development? Does. Yeah, no, I think you totally hit it on the head. Um, I think as uh, growing up and, and being in the spotlight and, and having the term prodigy, I feel very similarly as you of, um, it doesn't mean, I, I wouldn't say at all that I had found any type of artistic vision. I, I was working towards it and I was also developing my chops through that and happening, happening to, um, document that on record. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of it also just becomes like the awe and virtuosic nature of, you know, a young person playing, um, the instrument really well. And, um, I think it wasn't until like my early twenties or just coming out of my teens of really wanting to strip all that back and, you know, just sit with myself and try to take away any of the, the expectations that I felt like others had on me that I felt like I had of what music I should be playing or what the jazz police was saying I should be playing uh, instead just be like, what do I want to say? What do I want to play? And um, 
I remember kind of taking a leap with one of my projects, which feels like home is from my go time album. And that was the first one where I had done kind of a video format and I had done um, a recording. I was really inspired by Snarky Puppy, how they initially years ago had started that format and were, you know, a great way to just get people all around the world to see one's work, potentially yep. see one's work. And I remember feeling like with that album, I really just want to make the music I want to make and dance around, you know, and wear the clothes I want to wear. And yeah. I remember going to my fans and doing a crowdfunding campaign, being like, I have this vision for what I want this to be. And it's going to be really fun and playful and it's going to be me. And previously to that, you know, I think there was just a lot of thoughts in my own head and expectations of like, you got to make a jazz record or like the jazz press won't like this. And what ended up happening is my fan base, which, you know, certainly some are versed in jazz and love jazz, but there's a lot of music lovers as well. We're just fully behind it and they back that whole project. And then I started seeing more of my super fans, like come out to shows and bring their friends. And, and it was just such a positive experience but to me it's like whether it flopped or whether it didn't well I was just like this is what's in my heart and that included recording like a singer songwriter work feels like home like you mentioned which by the way in the past when I've I've always written that type of music I just I've you know as a kid loved listening to like James Taylor and Carol mm -hmm. King and I would just do it for me I'd sit down at the piano and I'd write the songs but I never saw how it would like you know how it fit with jazz and saxophone and I'm like F it, whatever. I want to just put my music out there. And yep. it was wild that, that that song touched so many people and won that award. And to this day, it's the it's the song of mine that people have like gotten married to or been like proposed to. And and um I remember working with some past producers um on like songs similar to that vibe, singer-songwriter vibes, and they were like, the saxophone has no place in that, or don't sing or don't play, right. you know, and even with that song, when I initially brought it to my band, I tried to jazzify it to make it fit more. And we, we tried reharming all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't like it. I think it just needs to be like what the song needs, Yep. you know? And so oh. I think getting out of my head, um, and, and I really encourage everyone listening, you know, aspiring musicians and musicians who are on their paths or artists who are on their path, like to just focus in on your expression. Cause it can get so noisy in one's head of like, mm, what, what's this person and this, you know, jazz press person or my mentor yep. are going to say about this or my peers, or is it too cringy or is it, you know, whatever it might be. Totally. <laughs> and just like follow your heart and do your thing. Cause I think ultimately that really resonates with people if it's this genuine piece of expression. Yeah. Yeah. That totally, I mean, all this resonates with me as an artist as well. Like I've, I've found myself moving from, like I've always been known as like a jazz trumpet player. And then I started playing a lot more funk and soul and yeah. always written songs on guitar. Like from the time that I was eight years old, I started playing guitar and I was in like a rock band in high school and I had all these songs and I was like, man, what? And, and like you're saying, it's like I, I wasn't able to see how these pieces fit together. And now I've been releasing a couple singles where I'm like layering horns. I'm singing a bunch of vocal parts. You know, I'm playing bass. I'm like doing I'm putting all the things that I do together in a really yeah. in a way that's like, oh, this is this is all of me, not just this one part. Right. Um, that's super that's cool. So cool. Yeah. So what, what was like working with uh, Elliot Skinner? I mean, what, what a, your, your voice is together. Magical. Uh, Elliot is just the most magical person and musician that I know. Like, actually, when I called him to see if he would, I was working on this, the song and I finished it and I was in my head. I'm like, I really think this should be a duet. It's mm -hmm. a love song. And um, he just immediately came to mind. I've been a fan of his for a long time. I did not know him well. We've like met at a few shows. Um, but I was like, I could literally hear Elliot's voice on this. So I just reached out to him and he was like, send me the song. And he, I sent it to him and he was like, I love it. Okay. And literally learned it in like a matter of days, came up with the harmony part, nice. memorized everything, came over, we rehearsed and we only went through it like two times. And the day that we recorded that version, we only played it through with my band like once. It really was, a, it was pretty darn live. And that take is a live take. 
Yeah. And there's something about making music with Elliot that, and I, I admire this so much about him. He drops in on such a deep level mm-hmm. and he's just, you can tell he's the type of artist and musician that's just wanting to create something magical with others and really inviting that energy in. And he's just listening and he's bringing himself in the moment. And before we performed that song, and I think you can find this somewhere on YouTube, we were both kind of telling stories about our partners and about love. And so uh, the two of us in the audience was just in that beautiful space. And Mm. like his fiance now wife was in the front row and my boyfriend and partner was in the back. And so we just, I'm really grateful that we captured it when we did because we were all like tapped in. Yeah. Yeah. Elliot is, uh, I'm just such a huge fan of his. He's, he's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. I, I mean, you know, it's one of those, one of those moments I could feel, I could feel that energy that you're describing, yeah. uh, watching the YouTube video, which is rare, I think, to get that from a screen to, to feel that energy, but man, I was, yeah. I was in it. I'm you know? so glad to hear that. I'm, a, you know, at heart, I think I'm, um, a live performance artist. And the reason why I wanted to bring that audience into the room is to have that energy and, mm-hmm. um, just everybody, all the musicians playing and our, our camera team, everyone had the most beautiful vibe. And I think, and I kind of handpicked the audience. I was going to be there too. Mm. And um, I, they were fans of mine, but also people I knew would be also down to hang out for like three hours yeah. <laughs> and listen to us and just be present. So it was pretty magical. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, so you, uh, you got, something like uh to, to sort of get into that that song on spotify i think has like seven million streams or something like that you've got a couple of videos on youtube that have a couple million views like that's sort of like viral um you've got one hundred thirty thousand monthly listeners on spotify fifty thousand subscribers on youtube blah 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 have you really is, is has it been a concerted effort for you to like build this part of your career as a way of as a means of passive income or is it just like oops this all happened because i've been crushing it with music Mm, that's a great question. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I um before that Go Time video series had no viral videos online, had maybe like a couple thousand monthly listeners. So yeah. um my goal with that project was to hopefully really boost my fan base and also reach um my existing fan base, but hopefully reach other music fans yeah. as well. And so um, you never know, you know, you try to put, I try to put a plan together and surround myself with other smart people that can help me strategize with how to do that. Part of it was being very consistent during that, during that time period of like dropping a video. I think it was like every two weeks and, uh, and also actively like engaging with my fans. I was doing a lot of, live streams. Um, and that was kind of a concentrated effort because these days, you know, when tour is happening again, it's like things go all over the place. But I think if you actively want to build your numbers and get, um, you know, more fans, more listeners, you've got to be putting out stuff on a regular basis, engaging with your fans. I mean, I really try to, to write back to people's comments, write back to DMs. Mm. Sometimes fans are surprised, like an email when I write them back, they're like, oh, it's actually you. It's like, yeah, it's it's yeah. actually me. I want to have this special connection, you know, with you, my fan, who's like spending your time and money and coming to shows and telling your friends. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I've also recently kind of step forward with more of a mindset of instead of perfecting things and making it this perfect thing, you kind of just got to keep putting stuff out. Um, you never know what's going to like hit. Right. And some of those videos, like sometimes it's the videos that I think are going to do terribly or not do anything that people are just like, this is amazing. And the ones that I feel like are really going to do great. It's like, then nobody's <laughs> paying attention to yeah. them. So, um, <laughs> And I, and I think it is important, like I'm an independent artist and to have all these different revenue streams um, and diversifying those revenue streams, yep. you know, it all is helpful and um, great to be building up one's fan base and help on the income side of things as well. And, you know, help get people out to live shows. So the people that I see these days who are really crushing it online and friends of mine are definitely very uh, consistent mm-hmm. with it as 
well and um, great at communicating with their audiences. So do you have a team now that like works with you? You mentioned that you've surrounded yourself with people that kind of know stuff. So like, what, what does that look like? Do you have a manager? Do you have somebody that helps you with social content or, or like a film crew, a go-to film crew? Do you have like people like that, that you kind of call on regularly? Yeah. So I have a pretty small team and we wear many hats. Um, I have an, an awesome in-house content team. I mean, I'll do a lot of my content just like on my phone, mm. but I also have just great people that I work very closely with, with a lot of projects who do like the video side of things like DP directing work, just great sound engineers as well. Um, so on the content side, and I edit a bunch of my own videos as well, but if I need extra help polishing things, those are my trusted people that I'll call upon. Sure. Uh, my agent does all of my bookings. So mm -hmm. he's kind of the, the main part on the live side of things. And then um, I'll work with different like consultants, depending on the project. Like I've just worked with different people that'll kind of, they're not full-time on my team, but I remember um, when I was working on Go Time Brooklyn, there's a wonderful woman, um, Becky Blumenthal, who had also worked with Snarky Puppy. And she was really wonderful and just helping me create little strategies as well for the videos. And then, um, but I like to just sit down and, and kind of write out my goals of what I want the project to, you know, goals for the project. And then also just try to write out a proposal and plan mm. of how I think, you know, that could sit. And then I like to send that plan around to other smart people who are experienced and be like, Hey, what do you think of this? You know, I think that I know I've fallen into this and I, I know other artists as well have this idea that maybe somebody just has the answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like your manager is going to change your career. They're going to have the answer. But the thing is, if you don't know your own goals mm -hmm. or you don't have a clear idea of what you want to do as an artist, then none of your team can really help you get there because then it becomes their idea or their vision. So I think really becoming clear on, on those those goals and what your vision is, is the most important part. And then you can find people that align with that and, and build your own team. I'm really an advocate for uh, independent artists to build their own team of yeah. people that are like-minded who want to go where you want to go instead right. of you getting plugged into a system that, you know, it's not your idea. It's not your vision. No. Which is sort um, of the old school record label model, right? It's like, yeah. They exactly. Sweep you into their system and go, oh, this is what we're going to do. Yeah. I mean, things are changing so fast. I mean, you know, Adam, with doing this podcast and video content, it's like we artists and independent artists have to be doing our own social media. We got to be the ones that are out there performing, talking to fans. We're wearing a lot of different hats, but I think a lot of this stuff, especially content, it genuinely can't come from anyone except you and it's your message. And ultimately, like I've had people, a lot of people online who are now seeing these videos and I've had, whether it's um, brands reach out to me saying, we love what you did with this fish and chips video. We love feels like yep. home. We want to license this song, like other opportunities come around, but I had to first put that content out there. Right. So that's something also long term for people, artists to think about. It's like some people think like, oh, it's so much work, social media, blah, blah, blah. And it's not everybody's thing. And if it's not your thing, you know, total respect, find something that you're passionate about mm -hmm. doing. Or if you just want to be doing studio work, like that's that's totally cool. But I have a, a passion for making content and um, you know, know that even though you're putting in all this time and you're, you're um, investing in yourself and your business and the future of that. And you never know, there's going to be opportunities that will align with right. something someone saw. You just have to get it out there. And because we're in the internet age, instead of having to like do a whole live show, you know, it, it's way easier to just film your own video and get it out there and see how it does. It's certainly much it's a very low risk thing because it doesn't cost, you know, and it doesn't have to cost anything. <laughs> right. right yeah. totally. So, uh, you know, you mentioned fish and chips. Um, 
that's another one of your like the the that video has you know something I don't know millions of views on it, and that's that's a collaboration with Leo P who who kind of rose to fame as the dancing berry player, um, and I remember like I remember listening to Too Many Zoos back in the day and being like, damn, who is this guy? He's killing you know, and uh, how, like you have also incorporated dancing now into your into your performing um and i i imagine that like i I was i had a question written down that was something like did you have any kind of internal struggle with starting to do that and you kind of already mentioned the jazz police and what and being worried about what a mentor might think or whatever um yeah so so i guess what allowed you to kind of leave that behind and then uh how did the collaboration with leo p start now you have two saxy right we are two saxy with you and Leo and you guys are doing like educational content and you're doing stuff in the studio, which is really cool. Yeah. Well, I am a big fan of Leo. I remember when I was in high school, I saw that viral video of him in the subway nope. with too many views. And I remember reposting that video, which I, I only reposted the things that I was really like mind blown, you know? And I just remember being like, this dude is making sounds out of the saxophone. I didn't even know were possible. He's like dancing and, so I was like, this is crazy. Check it out. This video. I never expected that we would meet. I never expected we'd have a band or would be like close friends and working together. Um, but just was a huge fan from, you know, those first few videos that I saw. Leo was the guy that initially, when I first met him, which it took six months for us to actually meet in person, because we'd been friends on Instagram, had tons of mutual friends. But it wasn't until like six months later where he was finally we're both in the same city and we're like, Hey, let's like get a little rehearsal space and like, let's jam. And it was just two saxophones. We got in and he started showing me some of his moves and we just like hit it off really quickly. And we're just, I mean, we must've talked for like an hour before we even played. And, um, I have a background in dance. I mean, I started ballet when I was six years old and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And then I was tap dancing from like, Eight. And a lot of people don't know in my very first concert, I tap danced and played the saxophone at the same time. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. And my sax teacher was, oh my, he was like horrified at the idea that I'd be moving with a sax. And he's like, you're going to yeah. chip your tooth. He's like, he was not for it. And yeah. that, you know, that speaks to what you're also talking about with that voice of like, what's my teacher going to say? What's my mentor going to say? Yeah. But then I really put dance away for a while. And I, I was also very much into acting as a kid. Um, Cause I just didn't see where that fit with the sax. And I was just in the jazz, you know, in the jazz world, learning that. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I always love to move when I play. It's very, um, it feels very uh, natural for me. Mm-hmm. Like I want to feel the music. Even when I go to concerts, like I'm the one who's kind of moving and just like feeling it. Mm-hmm. And I remember Leo really unlocked something in me, just watching him do what he does so effortlessly with dance and feeling just so free to express himself. And and that really made me question, do I need to, you know, lock away this dance thing? Cause look, he's doing it. And I, I would love to bring, bring back that element of dance that I love so much. And so it was really him like getting together, jamming. He was showing me some moves. Mm -hmm. I started to like, you know, work in some of that. And I, and he was the first one I saw that was dancing with sax, which is not an easy thing to do. It's definitely a heavy instrument. Yeah. Um, and with the baritone, it's, it's incredible what he does. And uh, it's been super cool now that we've been in, doing a lot of our educational de- endeavors. We have an, mm. we have an online saxophone school called Saxy School. We've recorded a masterclass series together. It's been very cool to see this next generation of saxophone players. Yeah. Um, many of them truly embracing their love for many styles of music, some of them dancing, some of them, you know, it's something that we really try to teach and lean into of you guys. We want you to express yourself. And yes, we're teaching you saxophone. We're teaching you jazz. We're teaching you pop. But um, I think it's something that was kind of missing from my education is um, the, you know, the um guidance of how to bring it all together or even just permission permission Permission. yeah let's start with that just permission yeah however you yeah it's like this stuff does not have to be boxed into you can only do this well that and then and and another one of my dear um inspirations and good friend john batiste he's a Mm. i've played in his band for um in the late show band in their first year and did a lot of touring with john and 
you know, he's, he grew up in New Orleans and comes just, I think, with a very clear picture and vision of how he wants to interact with his audience. And he yep. was the first person that I'd be marching behind him, you know, in the audience, in the Ed Sullivan Theater. We'd be in Times Square doing love riots with people. And just, I learned so much from him, too, of being mm -hmm. like, wow, here is this incredible musician. And John can play anything and knows everything about jazz. And, yep. and but he's like connecting with the audience and doing his thing in such yeah. cool. I, mean, I, I spent a bunch of time down in New Orleans and, and uh, I play a lot of New Orleans style brass band music. That's a big part of what I do. And like, I've played the crew de vous parade. I've sat in on the Sunday second lines in New Orleans and like that whole culture. I mean, the, like dance and music are so intertwined. It's like, if you're playing on the street, the expectation is that people will run up and start to dance. And I sit coming from the Midwest. It's so different because in the Midwest, it's like, people will sit very quietly and, and, and stoically and you'll be putting on this raucous show. And then yeah. you'll be like, I, I can't tell if anybody likes this. And after the show, they'll be like, that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. It was like, I couldn't, right. that, you know, but in new Orleans, it's like this, it's this much more overt uh, mm. feeling of like, this is dance and music are the same. Uh, yeah. which I always loved about that. And it really like playing that music, open that kind of unlock that for me. Uh, being being somebody who's like yelling on the mic, trying to do crowd participation, dancing yeah. on the, in the parade, holding the horn up high over somebody's head. There's a big float behind me, you know, um, super. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can feel that energy. And it's weird. It's crazy, too, because the first time I saw John was with Roy Hargrove's quintet in like the 90s. Oh, you know, huh. like he was young. Yeah. I remember yeah. when he was doing that festival circuit with Roy because yeah. I'd seen him at some of the jazz fests. Yeah. And they did a couple of radio shows and there's like video of that on YouTube that you can find now. And it's like, it's yeah. just so rad to see it's, you know, and, and I've, I've been obsessed with his new album too. I've been listening to it. So, like, good. so great. It. And, yeah. and anytime I see an artist, like, like, like what you're doing now, what John has done is like come from this jazz background and then really blossom into this like beautiful artist writing these incredible tunes and expressing themselves in, in all these different ways. I just think it's so rad. Um, and I just listened to you tell the story about uh, getting a text from John, see if you play clarinet, if you play. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit, that that interaction of like how you got onto the the Stephen Colbert show with. with oh, that? yeah. Um, so one of my favorite saxophonists uh, who is just crushing it today, but I've known about him since I was in middle school is um wonderful cat, Eddie Barbash. And oh, yeah. he plays bluegrass saxophone. Like, I mean, he's made a whole style himself, but I, I went to the um, Brewback, Brewback Jazz Colony camp with Eddie when I was like 14 or maybe, yeah, 13 or 14. And Eddie's uh, a few years older. And um, we got to know each other then. And fast forward years later, Eddie was playing in John's band and mm -hmm. they met in Juilliard at Juilliard. And um, I'd lost touch with Eddie for a little while. Uh, and I remember I was in New York. This was probably like eight or nine years ago, um, actually at the APAP convention. And I just happened to run into Eddie and he was like, hey, like, what's up? You should come out tonight. We're playing at this. He gave me the address. I'm playing with this guy, John Batiste. Uh, bring your horn. And I, I remember meeting John in the festival circuit when he was playing with Roy Hargrove. And we'd like always kind of wave at each other, but we never got a chance to meet and play. So I went that night and it was really cool. It was just kind of this, I don't know what it was, like a private party and quest love was hanging out. And I was like, wow, this is cool. Yeah. Um, and they were playing. There's a bunch of photographers and just like really cool artsy people. And then John, you know, was like, come sit in with us. And we had an absolute blast. And after that, um, I started going to a lot of his shows because I'm a really, I've been a big fan of his live show since like day one mm -hmm. and I've always said this to John and the, and the cats in the band of like I will be there in the front <laughs> row cheering and just enjoying your show whether I'm playing or not and and that even just that interaction you know I'd go to their shows and then we'd all hang out afterwards and we hit some jam sessions and started to develop a little bit of a relationship with John okay. and then he started to call me for some gigs he had me as like a special guest at Blue Note, and then he had me, cool. you know, at the Newport Jazz Fest, and then, but that was all way before he got the gig as band leader for the Late Show, Stephen right. Colbert, and so then he'd call me for that, and, um, and I think that's 
an example, and I, I try to talk about this with my students too, of like really developing relationships within the industry and especially of people that you admire and feel compelled, you know, like I said, I was a fan first um, mm -hmm. of just him and the band and I would just go see them and just letting that person know too. I remember just say, saying to him after gigs, like, this was amazing. I just love what you do. It would, I hope we get to play one day, but you know, I'm yeah. always going to be here. You know, we um, talk about that on this show, a lot of the importance of just being on the scene of, of, of being at shows, hanging out until after the show's over and talking to the band, that kind of stuff. I mean, it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that was really where that all stemmed. And, um, but it was, you know, I, there were periods of time that I would jump in and do a bunch of stuff with John. And then, but before the late show, I hadn't talked to him in a while. And then I just remember getting a random text from him um, being like, Hey, you know, do you play clarinet? Remind me. <laughs> and then, you know, Hey, what do you do? It was like Friday and I didn't have any, I only had my alto with me. And he was asking me about like baritone and clarinet. And honestly, those are instruments I have not played since eighth grade. Uh -uh. And he was like, what are you doing Monday? Can you come to that Sullivan theater and play? And I called my Yamaha endorsement family. And I'm like, can I get a clarinet and a baritone? And like it, now, yeah. Yeah. And I literally had that weekend to be like, how do I replay? How do I learn the baritone sax and the clarinet in a couple of days. Spoiler alert, you, you can't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but man, it was like, uh, I was really, I'm very grateful to John that he took that, you know, he wanted me to, to join them. And I learned so much in that time. And that's also when I was getting my like baritone chops together. Yeah. Family having me play Barry, but it would, it would differ. Sometimes I'd walk in and he'd like hand me the guitar and be like, all right, you're going to play this today. <laughs> or just, we'd all have tambourines and you never know what's going to happen with him. And I think that's something that was really fun musically. Yeah. You know, totally. Learning new songs every day and just whatever it might be. Yeah. That's awesome. And so, and he didn't like, I, you, you said he didn't send you like PDFs or anything, right? No was, music. We're like, what are we going to play? I don't know. Maybe we'll play this. I'll, I'll learn the theme song from YouTube or something, right? Literally no music. And John Lampley, yep. great, great Trump player and, and dear friend who plays in their band. I, I remember calling him and being like, so what are we going to play? You know, he's like, I don't know. He's like, you never know with John, but learn the theme song and bring some manuscript paper. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, so I think it's hard uh, for musicians who are building a career to see the light at the end of the tunnel. When you're working with younger musicians who are scraping by, what sort of things do you recommend uh, for building a sustainable life in music? I feel like we've talked about a lot of it, but if there's anything else that we haven't covered. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, I think um, there's different type of goals for, for people. Um, some people know that they want to be band leader and want to develop their own career. And that's certainly like the path I've been on since, since a, a young age. And then, you know, some cats, like I was mentioning earlier, perhaps they just want to have a life doing studio um, right. work and never posting a social media clip and, and just working on um, kind of the inner circle of, of studio musicians and cats. I think this, you know, the sooner you can kind of figure out at least what you want to go for now, if you're interested in having a, a solo career, you know, start to, to have a vision for what that might look like and be able to start to draw out some steps of um, what it's going to look like to develop that, which might just start out as, you know, making a series of videos or getting yourself out there on social media, starting to net, well, for everybody, it's certainly great to start to meet other people, other musicians in the community and develop relationships. Um, you never know where that'll, that'll take you. A lot of people, and I know this is the case for my band, I call my friends who I know are incredible musicians and are gonna get the job done well and are gonna be a great hang. So that, there's a social part to what we do, you know, totally. as well. Um, but I think also um, another thing that I like to tell my, younger students who are aspiring musicians is really take as many opportunities as you can early on. Um, that's just where you're getting a lot of experience and just say yes to like as many things as you can, because you're going to be figuring out as you do those gigs or when you're meeting 
people. That's a great time to meet people. Yeah. Um, but you'll be figuring it out as you go. What is working? What's not? What do you want to be doing more of? Who is, you know, oh, I love working with that person. I love what they're doing. I want to align more or have a career similar to them, but without having that experience. Um, or if you close yourself off too early and be like, I'm only taking these gigs or that gig, right, right. Um, then you're not fully going through that. So early on, you know, I was playing like all sorts of gigs and with everybody and meeting just every gig, be meeting cats and people I'm still working with today. I've mm -hmm. had some gigs that were like complete disasters too, just in the past of just like the, the gig was really weird, but I would meet someone on that gig that we like hit it off. I remember like at one point I met this really great guitarist in LA and I actually met my, um, my close collaborator for, uh, for sound design and, and video work. I met him on that gig. Oh, cool. Yeah. So that's really important and yeah. you'll figure out, you know, a lot in that process. Yeah. It's, and, you know, it takes time for other people's careers to, to take off too. And so that's probably the most, yes, that's that. Yes. It takes time. Yeah. 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 So oh you might God. find out, yeah. Like keep telling students that too. It's like, you might find that after 10 years, somebody that you worked with 10 years ago, all of a sudden, I mean, I keep hearing people tell those kinds of stories too. Rex Richardson tells a story about meeting Lester Bowie and then getting called to tour with Joe Henderson, like eight years later. And Lester Bowie wow. gave Joe Henderson his number. They met at a jam session, you know, eight years prior. It's like little things like that where you're like, man, you never know. And if you're not in the game anymore and you get a call from somebody like Joe Henderson, you're like, uh, I don't play anymore. You know, it's right. Bummed. Right. Yeah. The game. I, I think I should have led with that. What you said about time, because, um, you know, I think some there's in this world of like the internet age and like, social media and 15 second clips mm -hmm. and you and getting anything you want, whether it's an Amazon delivery or looking something up on YouTube so fast, yep. there's this idea that it should all just happen at that speed, but media city. Yeah. Yeah. You're building a, you're building a career, you're building relationships with people. So that stuff absolutely takes time. Yeah. Cool. Well, is you know, I, I think I saw some stuff on Instagram where you were like recording music videos. What, what do you have coming up that we should be keeping a, an eye out for? Yeah, I'm actually working on a new album right now, um, and that's going to be out in the fall, probably in October. But before that comes out on streaming, uh, I'm doing a, re a release tour starting in August through October. So I'll be hitting 23 cities um, all around the U.S. Yeah, and people can find those tour dates on my uh, online, on my website, gracekillingmusic.com. Also, I'm posting them on my um, socials. Uh, hope to see cats out there um yeah I'm, I'm looking forward to that and then um you know as i'm working on that i'm working on a, a bunch of music videos for those songs as well so people will be able to watch them online we did a studio session two weeks ago where it was similar to the to my go time project where we we're doing live takes video and audio so people can see that that i'll all be dropping in the next coming out in the next few months. Awesome. Fantastic. We'll link all that in the show notes of the show. So anybody listening can find all those links there. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. This was super awesome. This is so awesome. Thank you, Adam. I really appreciate you having me on your show and I'm, I'm so excited to, to reconnect with you. Yeah. Awesome. Likewise. Cool. Sure. See you. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Gig Boss Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit like and hit subscribe. That helps us out. And if you really dig the podcast, you can give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and write a little review. By doing that, that helps us kind of show up in other people's feeds. We've got a great group of musicians that really want to figure out how to navigate this new music economy, and they want to help each other out. And that's happening at the Gig Boss Podcast Facebook group, which is linked in the show notes below. Click the link, join us in the Gig Boss Podcast Facebook group so that you can get a deeper understanding as we do debriefs of these episodes and talk about the concepts that are brought up in the episodes. That's it. Thank you so much for listening.